thank you everyone for um, attending the consumer and fintech panel. So here I am with our fellow panelists. We have Sonia from VentureSuk and uh, Sarah from uh, uh, Clio Capital, Ishan uh, from HOF Capital, and uh, Yusuf from E11 Capital. Uh, I'm Catherine Chen. I'm the founder of uh, MarketX Ventures. We are a global pre-IPO investment firm. Uh, we helped our clients invest in mostly US, China, and Southeast Asia uh, pre-IPO companies. And I'll have each of our panelists uh, do a little intro about themselves. Hi, I'm uh, Sonia Gokhale. I'm one of the partners at VentureSuk, which is an early stage investment platform based here in the US. Uh, but we've invested in about 115 uh, companies uh, globally, with about half in the US, the rest in MENA, Africa, and India. Hi, I'm Sarah Kunst. Um, I'm the founder and managing director of Clio Capital, an early stage opportunistic venture fund. I'm based in Silicon Valley, invest across the US uh, and across the world as long as I can wire money to a US bank account. Hi, I'm Hisham Al Haddad. Uh, I'm a co-founder and managing partner at Hoff Capital, and we're a multi-stage investment firm based in New York and San Francisco um, with $140 million in AOM. Um, yeah. Hi, my name is Yusuf Al Mulla. I'm co-founder and managing partner of E11 Capital. We actually invest in US and uh, regionally. We recently got set up in ADGM, so we are an ADGM, ADGM fund manager, fund company VC also, focused mainly on growth uh, in MENA region. Great, too. So starting the panel, I'll, I will be the pulling some data. In Q3 2019, uh, FinTech funding has topped 8.9 billion, um, and this is a record high since 2017. Uh, as of 2019, year to day, we have 24.6 billion raised so far. Uh, it's a very exciting across U.S., China, uh, Southeast Asia, you know, the rest of the world, and we have a great, very diverse uh, panel today. So my first question will be, what are some of the top trends you're seeing in fintech and consumer tech sectors? Uh, what are some of the regional highlights you would like to bring up? Sure. Um, since we're kind of global investors, we get to see um, trends that are around, that are happening in the U.S. and that are happening here regionally. So in the U.S., we've noticed um, some trends. First, we saw a, a lot of like gig economy workers. So there's, there were fintech companies coming up around that. Then we saw, um, because of, in response to a hot, um, uh, and especially a hot SF uh, real estate market, there was fintech companies coming around with all cash offers, et cetera. And then now, after kind of the success of Brex, we see a lot of fintech um, companies that are that are servicing and targeting startups and SMEs, and that seems to be a global trend. We recently invested in a company who you know very well, called Vouch, uh, which is backed also by Ribbit um, and is was was founded by a fintech veteran Sam Hodges, and it's a it's a startup uh, that's insurance based that's geared mainly only towards startups, and it's really just following the Brex model. So we see that that as a trend um, is really. Just companies that are targeting startups as their, as their market. Definitely. SMEs are uh, definitely uh, vouching for the growth of fintech in edge areas. So maybe uh, we can also have Sarah talk about what you're seeing from your uh, sectors. Yeah. So, I mean, I think uh, the big consumer trend in tech right now um, is that it feels like there's sort of a second wave happening um, in retail. Uh, things like Depop, which is based in London, which has sort of become a second wave kind of eBay, Etsy, um, and you're starting to see some disruption um, even around like ride sharing companies, next generation, you know, kind of Airbnb challengers, certainly banks are in fintech is, is being sort of totally disrupted. And so I think that now that we're over a decade out from the launch of the iPhone, um, Facebook is a teenage company, um, and they're starting to just be a shift, um, and it's a really exciting time. I'm even getting a lot of pitches for new social media, for new social networks, right? It's people who want to take on Facebook. I'm seeing companies that want to take on Google and search, and those are things that just weren't happening a few years ago. Um, so one of the uh, areas that we looked at is actually looking at fintech uh, coming from, you know, maybe China. We have. Uh, 
in financial, obviously one of the biggest names in fintech, uh, WeChat, and really has uh, created an ecosystem of mega apps that's uh, driven by the financial arms. So love to learn more about what's going on in the rest of the world, uh, maybe in the MENA region as well. Uh, what are the highlights in fintech? I, I can speak about the rest of the world for sure. I think some of the fastest growing companies in fintech that got a big chunk of that global funding that you mentioned uh, have been in emerging markets. So you see the, uh, the challenger banks, uh, for example, that are uh, growing uh, in the likes of Brazil, like New Bank, um, that are serving essentially underserved uh, segments. Um, so given, um, given in, in the US we have Chime serving the millennial generation or New Bank serving the underbanked, I think we're going to see the same thing in MENA just when regulatory tailwinds come uh, to follow what's happening in Latin America. I, mean, I, want, to, I want to emphasize more on, on how fintech uh, investments basically has grown tremendously in the past two years, and especially, um, I mean, especially for a number of deals, actually, that uh, happen in the region. And uh, if we look at the region right now, I mean, in two, 2018, we had 46 deals, and 2019, we had 51 deals so far. So it is leading, basically, uh, Fentech is leading the region from an investment perspective for a number of deals. Uh, and however, uh, the, the, a lot of these investments are happening in early stage, so, uh, so the, the, the ticket size is small, so there's a lot of investments are going, I mean, from, a, from, a, from an investment perspective, from a value perspective, a lot of them is going to the other, other, other sectors. So I think that's where there is an, we see that there is an opportunity for kind of, uh, additional investment to go into Fentech at the later stage, actually, because out of the, let's say, 70, uh, 97 Ds that happened in, in the past two years, we think, we, we believe, I mean, even as, as a fund, that there will be an opportunity for um, uh, VCs like us, or gross VCs like us, to basically choose the winners and help them kind of grow across the region and most, more, maybe outside of the region. So that's, that's where I think uh, the opportunity is, and that's why, uh, I mean, we recently uh, worked uh, to set up our kind of, uh, get, um, um, basically to have a set up an ADGM to, to focus uh, on the growth and, and kind of, you know, choose the right, I would say, the winners and, and, and help them grow across the region. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And uh, I guess because we cover a lot of China and Southeast Asia, I also share a little bit about what I've seen in this market. Um, so in 2019, there were 87 deals done in Southeast Asia with uh, 700 million deployed in uh, a lot of these regions like Indonesia. So if you look at Grab and Gojek, which created as a ride hailing uh, app, but now is actually really emerging as the largest fintech players. Indonesia was uh, yeah, a couple years ago, 3% credit card penetration rate. Today, we have everybody using Go Wallet. So I think that's definitely a really exciting trend in the payment and also uh, just like FinTech in uh, payments, we transfer. I'd love to hear our panelists to talk about maybe some of the other areas in RegTech, InsureTech, uh, and maybe you know, some areas that maybe your portfolio companies cover. Um, we have uh, a couple uh, interesting we, cause we, uh, portfolio companies locally, regionally, that um, we're very excited about. As you mentioned before, um, fintech is still a little bit nascent here. Um, there's, it's, it's a super exciting time in the region for fintech because um, we're, we, we, we're, we kind of lag a little bit in the rest of the world, but so much is happening, especially at the early stage um, right now, and it, I think the next three to five years here locally, FinTech is, is kind of the place to be investing. We invested in a couple of infrastructure plays regionally that we think will help um, actually catalyze the, the ecosystem a little bit in terms of, um, of, of the region. We invested in uh, the local version of Plaid called, uh, called DAPI, uh, and, they, and they will be the infrastructure with other other players will build their own fintech companies, which, which is super exciting for the region. And also the local version of Venmo, um, which, which we just don't have here yet, and, then, and that will, will, will make everybody's life super easy, much Definitely. easier. So me as an investor, want to invest in that um, at, at a personal level. 
Uh, looking at the rest of our portfolio companies, um, I was mentioning before that we are we are very hot on SMEs, so we've been doing quite a lot in India, uh, and we have two two kind of exciting portfolio companies that are targeting uh, SME specifically. They've taken mom and pop stores that do everything literally on paper, on ledgers, and put, every, put that online, and they've now, it's called OK Credit and Cut the Books, and they've now become two of the fastest growing companies in India. Uh, one is backed by, by uh, Tiger Global, and um, the other one's backed by uh, Tencent and Sequoia, um, and they're growing fast and getting funding um, extremely fast, so they're, uh, the SME culture is, is, seems to be a trend that we're looking at a lot. Um, so at the same time, we noticed that there's a lot of uh, fintech that are trying to go global. We have N26 from Germany, we have New Bank in Brazil, um, and in Indonesia we have uh, some like Destera. Uh, what do you guys think about the next five or ten years? Is fintech going to be uh, global, one player trying to target one specific area, or do you think it's more of a regional play? I definitely think there's... Uh regional network effects that a lot of these payments companies um, will benefit from. Um, so sp speaking about that and also about uh, some of our new portfolio companies, uh, one of our fastest growing portfolio companies is actually building this tribe for Africa. And founded three years ago, they now process over $4 billion in annualized uh, transaction volume. Um, and just being on the ground, um, getting these merchants on board, and that's very, very sticky. And I think it's very hard for a global player to kind of come and, and, and replace them. So I think you'll have the same trend in happening in different markets. Um, same thing with uh, the challenger banks that are targeting very specific segments and building products differentiated for them. So we recently led a $44 million round in a company uh, that's building a new bank for millennials, starting with a rewards platform that has a couple of million users um, going from Canada into the US and specifically building a product that is attractive for millennials. So I think these companies will definitely um, have a sticky regional play. So on that note, sorry, go Yeah, ahead. I just want to, I just want to add, um, I think what's going to happen is we're still going to have regional players, but there will be um, some, of maybe some large players who are interested to kind of expand and use kind of, you know, their kind of um, uh, network, uh, I'd say, you know, from other regions, you know, and acquire some of the kind of uh, regional based, uh, I mean, as we see the region here has, has been hot lately and there's a lot of kind of uh, successful acquisitions and uh, exits that happen. So I think it's still authentic like any other sector. Today it's, it's dominating from, especially in the region, from an investment perspective. I mean, almost this year alone, uh, I think, what, 94 or 98%, according to actually report came out by, uh, which was developed by Magnet uh, and uh, ADGM, actually, like almost 98% of the investments year to date, 2019, happened in FinTech. Wow. So, so you can see this, that, that there's a growth in sector like any other sectors. I mean, if you go back a few years ago, it was I think, more consumer or uh, related, more uh, e-commerce kind of uh, platform, logistics were, were hot in, a few years ago, but now, the, consu the consumer e-commerce and the logistics are taking the more money and all the early stage are going to, into. Uh, so, I so what I think is that down the road, like other, other sectors, um, uh, there might be consolidations because we see it happening in more kind of, let's say, developed sectors in, in tech. So Fentech definitely will have some consolidations happening uh, down the road. And this is what we actually, right. as, as E11, actually want to work on and focus on in our next fund. Yeah, so I, on that note, uh, I do want to cover a little bit about what you mentioned. Uh, with a lot of the companies today, uh, Amazon, Google, Apple, everybody is trying to have a fintech play. It's as if every company is fintech today. So how do you think about the changing dynamic between banks and also some of these tech technology companies? I mean, we've seen some of the biggest uh, banks in China working with the Tencent Alley. We've seen in US, Amazon creating their own card, everybody issuing new cards. So what do you guys think about going forward how do you think uh, banks' position in uh, you know, fintech in mean, the world? Sorry, I just want to correct myself. It was 89% of early stage investments. Okay. That happens in, in, re in the region, uh, into fintech, basically. Great. All right, so coming back to this question, uh, mm. Nidia, does anyone yeah. want to take on it? Can I just add, yeah, on that question, um, uh, I think um, a lot of the banks in the region uh, 
are you know putting a lot of money investing in developing themselves from a digital perspective and uh, We've heard recently one of the banks is closing down a lot of their branches and, and, and let go of a lot of people because they invested so much money into innovation and digital. And also, um, uh, I mean, we, we're working on a, on, a, on a project also where one of the banks created um, uh, basically um, a, a, a payment platform, a, a, in a way like a debit card or credit card for, for, um, for employees. So, so there are actually, there's a lot of investment going in the, in the conventional banking, and there's a lot of investment going into the to fintech. However, I think um, uh, still uh, they are not open for fintech startups to work with them. And I think because the region is, is maybe, because it's in, I say, a new sector right now, there's a lot of money going and developing this. But one thing um, I just want to highlight um, is actually ADGMs uh, have developed a digital sandbox where basically they've created an opportunity for uh, banks and fintech innovators and startups to basically work together in creating um, uh, basically prototypes or, uh, and, and test different kind of uh, solutions that can address some of the challenges that a lot of banks are going through. So there is these opportunities that's coming up in the region. That's why fintech is becoming kind of a hot uh, so topic I, right I, now. I agree yeah. with that. Regionally speaking, um, because of the regulatory issues, it, it's, it's still a little difficult for, for the fintech companies, but these sandboxes that we, like our, one of the companies we invest in, Adapi, is in, is in both the Dubai and the Abu Dhabi sand, sandbox, and that's helping them grow and being able to expand regionally is because of the, the participation in, in the sandbox and, and big, because they're working with the regulators. Yeah, and working that's with actually them. very similar to what Singapore has done, exactly, right? Yeah, yes, I mean, yeah. not to throw yeah. kind of a political yeah. statement here, but um, you know, we've seen kind of what's been happening in Hong Kong lately. And uh, actually last year, we've seen a lot of the Asian companies move to Singapore due to the policy changes. So obviously there's a relationship between how government policies really inflect um, in FinTech innovation. Um, so what do you guys think about um, on the, you know, looking 20 years down the road, when we look at millennials, gener Gen Z, uh, what are some kind of trends in that area that has really um, shown FinTech I have a little bit of more of a dystopian view um, in, in regards to at least the traditional banks because they're built their cost, their entire cost infrastructure um, is built on com completely different. These legacy systems are, are uh, in my opinion, in the long term, uh, going to fail compared to the, uh, or at least versus the uh, cost efficient value propositions that these fintech companies will be able to uh, build and serve their customers with. Um, I don't think, I think right now the only thing that's protecting them and that's causing these partnerships is really the regulatory environment where you need a bank license to be able to offer uh, lending, for example, mm -hmm. or you need a banking license to do this. Once that starts to loosen up a little bit, like for example in Europe, you're going to see that, I mean, this is just in the last uh, very short period of time, you have Revolut, Monzo, N26. Um, these are multi-billion dollar uh, values that, are, that were just created in the last two years. And so I think we're going to see that happening more often and, and, and in other places. Again, verticalization of the industry with very specific value propositions. And the banks, I think, are going to have, a, uh, in, in the long term, a hard time being yeah. sustainable. That being said, I do kind of like the idea that my bank has a license and my money is insured. <laughs> and so I think that there's a, a yeah. balance there, right, of, of challenger. Uh, I, I think that what we'll see will be a lot of consolidation where because these existing banks, because the legacy banks have so much money, they're going to start buying and, and they have already started to buy a lot of these startups. And also some of these fintech tools, they're not really banking startups. They're tools to make interfacing with your bank on the other end easier. And I think that we see that mm -hmm. less in the U.S., but in other markets where, you know, there's sort of everything is a fintech company, right? Your, your rideshare company or your chat app all has banking elements built in without having to have a safe where your money sits. Yeah, actually, um, that's quite interesting. When we started out our platform, we were on WeChat because in China, uh, you know, the policy-wise open, it was a couple years ago, so, you know, relatively new. Anyone knew was trading pre-IPO shares like on, you know, WeChat. So we got like 50,000 signups right away just because word of mouth. Um, and then, you know, we also in, 
uh, UK and also Germany, a lot of these companies are leveraging government policy to really reach out for the user engagement, user acquisition, um, you know, thanks to great tax policies as well. So on that note, we have very little time left, so I would like to switch gears and focus on consumer tech a little bit. Um, so this year, we've seen a lot of uh, interesting things happening in consumer. Um, uh, first of all, if you look at probably everyone in this room has heard of TikTok. Uh, it is now the most expensive pre-IPO company in the world. Last round is valued at 75 billion. Um, we ourselves alone have seen a couple hundred million transaction in this name. So just curious, um, you know, what do you see as the top trends in consumer tech and what are some uh, predictions for the next five years? Is anybody here on TikTok? Granted, we're also... There's, all there's <laughs> one guy over there. I want to see your TikToks. Um, I think that's part of what's really interesting, though, right, is, is in part of what will be the trends, and certainly you can speak to this, that it, it's a younger generation that are using just totally different tools in totally different ways. Um, and, and things like not very many people my parents' age are on Instagram, but not many people, you know, my, my niece and nephew's age are on Instagram either. It's really sort of each generation feels like it's kind of getting the, the consumer tools they want, um, which is, is cool, but it does kind of make you wonder about the longevity of some of these platforms. Yeah, I'm thinking about just the millennials and, and how that's changing. And, and it's like TikTok had over 750 million downloads in this year alone. That's a lot. <laughs> that's that's quite a lot. And as you're saying, like it's 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 a very different environment. And when it, when that kind of also translates to to to, to fintech, uh, is that millenn like our parents used to just go to banks and trust the banks, and that was they didn't question it. Millennials have an inherent distrust for banks, and they don't like credit after the, cre the global credit crisis. Um, so, they, so a lot of the world is now switching towards the way these right. millennials now operate. As you, like we were talking about this before, you're saying millennials don't like to read. <laughs> like, we get everything in in like 30 second blurbs of uh, and like, uh, like videos and, and everything. And so e everything when it comes to fintech or how how um, how uh, companies are are now reaching the consumer has to be changed entirely to this no new millennial way of thinking and um, and that's shorter shorter bites and that's why TikTok is is super interesting because it, it just it buys into the exactly the way millennials are now thinking right and uh, on that note I also uh, wanted to see how you guys feel about the Robin Hood incident this year uh, they launched the you know savings and somehow without checking with some of the regulatory authorities. Obviously, now they fixed that problem. Um, but how do you think that really is a reflection of, uh, you know, maybe in a consumer mindset, the younger generation? Um, where do we see are some of the risk management areas that we need to focus on? I, I think um, with respect to, like, is a lot of us in the, in the younger generation have seen the way Uber and everything operates. They just expanded and then worried about the, the the laws completely later, right. and they just paid off the fines and did whatever they needed to do. But they just went, they just threw the doors open and just did ever, whatever they wanted to. Do. And a lot of the younger generation is seeing that, so they don't always necessarily think of the regulation, the regulatory issues, or whatever. They're just using these apps that are sent their way, and they're thinking that it's going to be okay. And if it's not okay now, they'll somewhat make it okay. Uh, so I think I, I think a consumer doesn't always always think of that. But when you're a founder and you're an investor, like that's a, that's a major major risk that you're thinking that you're because you could be shut down. But right. yeah. So Isham, I know you do a lot of AI focused uh, areas in startups. Um, we also see a lot of AI deployed uh, today in both fintech and consumer tech. Could you cover a little bit about what you see in this market? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think with, with AI, I think in the next at least five years, it's still going to be predominantly um, just automating a lot of inefficient tasks, um, creating cost efficiencies for enterprises. At least that's what I personally think is the, uh, is the largest opportunity in the short term. So recently uh, um, invested $20 million in a enterprise AI company focused on customer service. Um, there's $600 billion being spent every year on customer service. I think every one of us in this room has probably had a, an experience with Expedia or with their telecom provider or with their financial uh, or banking provider um, that has just took an hour of their time and an hour of minimum wage for the company uh, to pay that agent. And so I think areas like this um, 
are definitely going to get automated. Uh, another one of our investments is called UiPath, and it's a robotic process automation right. uh, platform. It's a seven billion dollar company that essentially automates all the back end inefficient and, and boring tasks within an enterprise. Yeah, we also see a lot of voice AI uh, deploying uh, financial services. Uh, we actually look at a company called Clink. They're Michigan-based, leveraging AI to really uh, help consumers interact with their bank. So when you talk to your phone, it's called the financial genie, Finny. So actually, you know, it feels like you're talking to your husband or wife. Um, so that's kind of where we see how AI can be played in that area. Uh, in terms of looking at, uh, you know, coming back to what we talked about earlier, regulation, what do you see as some of the uh, very beneficial uh, policies that we have seen that helps, you know, fintech companies grow, maybe in, in U.S. or rest of the world? I can, I can talk about the region. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, I think what, you know, the, if you compare, like, the region, MENA with, like, U.S., I mean, my view is that, uh, in, U in U.S., the startups or the companies, uh, they kind of develop everything and then they go back to the government and say, okay, can you fix the regulation to fit us? But I think here is the way, uh, way a bit different. Here, the government is actually putting a lot of regu regulations and, and uh, kind of even developing different frameworks in order for um, fintech or other, other startups, tech startups, basically, to be able to kind of develop. So they're kind of creating uh, the ecosystem, basically, uh, with the, because they know. I mean, they're going to have a lot of regulations. So they, so the government's trying to be here more advanced or in, uh, ahead, uh, in order to put the systems in place and the regulatory frameworks in place, in order for to create that, let's say, innovation ecosystem. So every startup can doesn't matter which sector, but for them to come and develop. I mean, if you look, whether it's the idea I've seen Dubai or ADGM here in Abu Dhabi. Uh, each has different different framework, you know, in order for them to uh, kind of um, uh, encourage the development of, of startups. Like for example, I mean, like the, the the two of the hot things right now, I think, in, in, in like for ADGM, if you for specifically, is is digital banking, for example. So they put a digital banking framework in place because, and I think if we talk about the trend and the next trend in, in, in fintech, I think digital banking will be kind of the big thing. And that's, I think, what the region needs, because there's a lot of startups and SMEs, they can't even open bank accounts here right now. That's a huge challenge. I've faced it. I have a lot of startups I know in the region, they face that. So, so that's, I think, the next opportunity if we talk about the region. So that's why ADGM have created the digi digital banking framework. And um, also from a kind of a digital asset perspective, too. So they even put a framework in place already for... Uh, with their sandbox, basically, for, for people to come in and, and kind of uh, uh, experiment different kind of um, uh, technologies or fintech, or fintech in order for them to kind of um, um, uh, address that need when it comes to kind of dig digital assets. So they want to make sure that the regulatory systems and frameworks are there so, you know, when the startups, they come to the region, they don't not face, you know, with the uh, challenge or they can't do their business. So. Yeah, so on that, I think, uh, you know, also what's noting, what's worth to mention is uh, sometimes fintech companies are really driving the policy changes in each uh, country. So, like, in Indonesia, what we see is that there's even a new concept called vin village fintech, right? So, it, this company, we invest at Varan Pandar, what they do is they actually uh, transform these Varans, which are basically street vendors, into actually micro financial service sellers. So, they sell, you know, they pay their loans and, you know, you know, minim minimize the uh, trouble that people have in terms of paying their electricity bills, for example. Um, and I know we have very little time left, so my last question for the panel is, what's your top prediction for 2020? Um, sure, I, as, as just to kind of, just even just an extension of what you're saying right now, my top prediction is, is kind of, uh, is everyone kind of hitting the markets that are underserved right now. Um, that's like in, in India, as I mentioned before, like some of these mom and pop stores or the tier two, tier three, three cities that, have, that are coming online, um, and this is around the world, and especially emerging markets, a lot of these, these second tier cities that are coming online and now making sure that they're um, consuming everything online, whether it's fintech or consumers, or et cetera, it's, it's to, to hit these, not, not the major cities anymore, so some of these other un, unbanked and underserved markets. Thank you. Sarah, Sorry, my prediction, um, I think that we're going to see around the world a lot of growing pains as the sort of unicorns. I think WeWork was a bit of a canary in a coal mine, and we're going to see a lot more of these billion-dollar-plus companies have to figure out if they're really billion-dollar-plus companies, and I don't think it's going to be very pretty. Yeah, I think unit economics are going to be at the heart of, 
of that, right? Profitability. Profitability, and uh, it's probably going to trickle down on the early stage startup ecosystem, which is great for us uh, in terms of valuations, but that's probably going to be the, the main topic of 2020. Mm -hmm. I mean, on a positive note, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From my perspective, I think um, uh, blockchain will play a big role right now on uh, b basically connecting the fintech with e-commerce and also the use of cryptocurrencies in a lot of e-commerce transactions. I think that's my next prediction. Well, great. With that, uh, thank you everyone for attending our panel and I look forward to meeting all of you. Thank you. Thank you.